Every October, we take the month and raise funds for organizations that help people who struggle with depression. It's called Overcoming the Darkness. AZ wrote in a few years ago talking about our Overcoming the Darkness campaign. I can tell everyone that no matter what you think, there is a way out of depression. And I'm living proof. I spent 30 plus years in a funk so deep, there are large chunks of my life I simply don't remember. At times, it was just a feeling of sadness and impending doom. I thought of ways out, many times. I finally got tired of barely being alive. I talked to a doctor and began taking antidepressants. Now I rarely get depressed or stressed, and I no longer find myself not dreading tomorrow. This is why our Overcoming the Darkness campaign is so important. It supports organizations that help people who struggle with depression so that they too can start looking forward to tomorrow instead of dreading today. Please donate today, right now if you can. Go to WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. You'd be forgiven for thinking the world of UK celebrity Gemma Collins was consumed with champagne, shopping sprees, and trips to Marbella. But it appears she's also consumed by conspiracy theories, particularly reptilian ones. Gemma confessed on her podcast recently that she is a firm believer in the dark, long-running theory that lizard people live among us. Admitting it was a little weird, Gemma said she's fascinated by the idea that shapeshifters really do exist, and she even added her own spin on the conspiracy. She thinks the lizard people have gone undetected for so long because they've been using a secret network of underground tunnels also allegedly used by Queen Elizabeth, to scurry about. Theorists say pop superstar Madonna could be one of them as well, along with Katy Perry and Angelina Jolie. Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, and the late Michael Jackson have also been accused of having a scaly underskin. The concept of half-reptile, half-human people even existing is rather bizarre, and in most ways flies right into the face of what we know about science and biology. So why do, by some estimates, up to 12 million people worldwide believe lizard people are among us? Where did this conspiracy theory even begin? I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! This is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… Hannah Beswick was so frightened by the idea of being accidentally buried alive that she even told her doctor that upon her death, she was not to be buried, just in case they had pronounced her deceased a bit too early. And that was the beginning of her very strange afterlife. Local legends hold that La Pascualita is the preserved corpse of the original shop owner's daughter, who died tragically on her wedding day. Others believe she's just a mannequin created by a very skilled artist. For over 90 years, the question has remained and no one has the answer. But first, millions of people think lizard people live among us, but where did the idea of their existence begin? If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com and click on Contact Social to follow Weird Darkness on social media. And also on the website, you can find the daily Weird Darkness podcast, which comes out seven days per week. You can enter monthly contests, find Weird Darkness merchandise, and more. You can even send in your own true story of something paranormal that's happened to you or someone you know. You can find it all at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. People 
people have been referencing sentient reptile entities, sometimes humanoid, sometimes not, going back to some of the earliest written works and legends known to man. In more modern times, according to a survey done by the firm Public Policy Polling, approximately 4% of Americans queried claim that they believe lizard people are influencing the world of politics, with an additional 7% on the fence on this question. So how did the idea of lizard people ruling the world ever start? To begin with, for those unfamiliar with our lizard overlords, while there are a variety of versions of this conspiracy theory, the general notion is that a few different types of reptilian humanoids walk among us. Chief among these creatures are a type speculated to come from the Draco constellation, because apparently the lizard people knew their little corner of the galaxy would look vaguely like a serpent from Earth when connecting the dots during a certain part of Earth's history, and so went ahead and spent millions of years evolving appropriately on their home planet to match. The Draconians are apparently tall, winged, reptilian humanoids who not only secretly rule over humans but more overtly rule over other types of lizard people as well. As for those others, the second most prominent group widely held among adherents to this conspiracy are the shape-shifting human-reptilian hybrids. Naturally, thanks to the fact that the lizard people are secretly working to control humanity, many former and current prominent world leaders, such as Queen Elizabeth II, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump, along with celebrities like Angelina Jolie, Betty White, Simon Whistler, and Katy Perry are all known to be shape-shifting reptoids. In fact, some years ago, I, Darren Marlar, was even accused of being a reptilian. I'll place a link to that in the show notes. As to why said reptoids wish to rule the world, there are a variety of reasons given, with the most prominent to being that they are here for our gold, and alternatively that they feed on negative energy from humans, particularly given off when we're afraid, angry, or just generally anxious. Thus, they wish to create an Orwellian world government system in order to more easily manipulate our collective emotions for their own sustenance. This now brings us to who actually first came up with the modern idea of these reptilian overlords in the first place. While, as noted, sentient reptilians of some form or another have seemingly been around in human legend for as long as we've been humaning, one of the earliest and most influential references of lizard people in more modern times can be found in Robert E. Howard's 1929 story, The Shadow Kingdom, published in the pulp magazine Weird Tales. Not coincidentally, these beings are shockingly similar to the modern perception of lizard people. In a nutshell, the story involves ancient shape-shifting reptilian humanoids with elaborate underground abodes who work in the shadows to rule humanity, including via infiltrating various groups and using mind control to influence world politics. This and subsequent works by Howard would go on to popularize some version of these lizard people, including in works by a close friend of his, H.P. Lovecraft. The concept caught on from here and has shown no signs of stopping in science fiction since. Noteworthy here for reasons we'll get to in a bit is one individual, Mystic Correspondence School founder Maurice Doriel, who would seemingly be inspired by Howard's lizard people when creating many written works for his followers most notably the Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean, except in Doriol's case he would use these science fiction characters to create a supposed real history of Earth that incorporates reptoids as factual beings. We'll keep looking further into the idea of lizard people being a real thing when Weird Darkness returns. October is birthday month for Weird Darkness, and this makes eight years of doing the show. But while it's our birthday, we want the gifts to go to those who help people who suffer from depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide or self-harm. That's what our Overcoming the Darkness campaign every October is all about. You can bring hope to those who are lost in the darkness. You can make a donation right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. 
I'll close out the fundraiser at the end of October and announce how much we raised. Our goal is to raise at least 5000 this month, but the more we raise, the more people we can help to climb out of their own personal darkness. If you've not donated yet, or if you'd like to give again, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. The fundraiser ends on Halloween, so please, give right now while you're thinking about it. WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. Welcome back to Weird Darkness, I'm Darren Marlar. If you like Weird Darkness and you want even more, you can check out some free audiobooks that I've narrated at WeirdDarkness.com. I've got free audiobooks there by Stephen King, H.P. Lovecraft, Charles Dickens, Robert Heinlein, and many independent authors who you may not have heard of but you'll definitely fall in love with. You can listen to all of these free audiobooks that I've narrated on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. We continue now looking into the conspiracy theory of real lizard people. Another notable incident that helped spread the idea of lizard people occurred in 1934 and 1935 when one G. Warren Schufelt was looking for gold in California. To aid in his endeavor, Schufelt invented a device that he claimed used radio X-rays to see deep into the earth and was apparently able to be used to find precious metals like gold as well. Of course, this device didn't actually use X-rays, but rather used a common dowsing pendulum, as described in a January 29, 1934 edition of the Los Angeles Times. Schufelt's radio device consists chiefly of a cylindrical glass case inside of which a plummet attached to a copper wire held by the engineer sways continually, pointing, he asserts, toward minerals or tunnels below the surface of the ground and then resolves when over the mineral or swings in prolongation of the tunnel when above the excavation. Using this device, the Times piece reveals a rather astonishing discovery made by Schufelt. Busy Los Angeles, although little realizing it in the hustle and bustle of modern existence, stands above a lost city of catacombs, filled with incalculable treasure and imperishable records of a race of humans further advanced intellectually and scientifically than even the highest type of present-day peoples. Schufelt himself goes on of the discovery, I knew I was over a pattern of tunnels, and I had mapped out the course of the tunnels, the position of large rooms scattered along the tunnel route, as well as the position of deposits of gold, but I couldn't understand the meaning of it. Schufelt did make a breakthrough, however, when he came across a Hopi Native American who went by the name Little Chief Greenleaf, as well as L. Macklin. Schufelt claims Greenleaf told him about 5,000 years ago, Hopi history speaks of lizard people who built vast underground cities in the region, recording their own history on gold tablets. Hearing this story, Schufelt connected the dots and believed he'd found one of these cities and could prove it because within the chambers he found, to quote, gold tablets with perfect corners, sides, and ends, scientific proof of the gold's existence. Of course, given that he was using nothing more than a dowsing pendulum, it's not really clear how he could have detected anything, let alone gold tablets hundreds of feet below the surface of the earth. And we're not really sure how claiming you found gold is scientific proof of finding gold. But he sure was happy to take investors' money to pursue the dig. On that note, with the story being published in newspapers across the country, Schufelt was able to both garner city support for the project in exchange for 50% of any gold found, as well as get sufficient money from investors to start excavating. Unfortunately for his investors, as often happens when you dig deep holes, the result is eventually encountering water, with the project ultimately stopping at a depth of about 350 feet because of this complication. While Schufelt had thus successfully accomplished drilling a well, Sadly, he did not manage to find any buried treasure. As to what happened to him after, he doesn't appear to have used his radio X-ray device on any other projects and more or less disappeared from history other than it being recorded that he died in California in 1957. As to the Hopi legend he used to garner so much support for his project, it should be noted here that while this story is often used as support of the existence of lizard people, Beyond the fact that no such tunnels were ever found, 
It is explicitly noted in accounts from Schufelt at the time that these were humans who simply used the lizard as their symbol. And indeed, while there is no known Hopi legend about literal lizard people, it was common for the Hopi to have clans that used animal names, such as a bear clan, a spider clan, and most pertinently to the topic at hand, there really was a lizard clan. As to the rest of the story concerning underground cities and technologically advanced peoples, there is no known reference to this in any surviving Hopi legend. Of course, given their history was passed down orally, much was lost before their stories started to be written down. That said, further raising questions about Schufelt's story is that there is no record of a Chief Greenleaf or L. Macklin in any surviving Hopi birth and death record. Of course, while extensive, these lists are not comprehensive, so it's possible Greenleaf really did exist. But as with the supposed Hopi legend of these advanced lizard people, all we have to go on is Schufelt's word. Whether Schufelt was simply a con artist or he legitimately believed vast tunnels filled with gold exist under the city of Los Angeles isn't clear. Either way, his claims are occasionally used as proof of ancient lizard people inhabiting the earth. Fast forwarding to 1976, we have The Twelfth Planet and subsequent similar works by Zechariah Stitchin, where he purports that beings known as Anunnaki from the planet Nibiru came to earth a half million years ago in order to acquire our, to quote, monoatomic gold, which they can use for traveling through dimensions, among other things. Thankfully for us humans who were used as slaves by the Anunnaki, this group ended up hightailing it off Earth because of a great flood that covered the planet. When the Anunnaki came back, they apparently were involved in the building of a variety of ancient structures, such as the pyramids. Noteworthy here is that Stitchin's Anunnaki weren't necessarily reptilian, but, as with Schufelt's story, would later be folded into the Lizard People conspiracy theory anyway. This finally brings us to the man of the hour and arguably the greatest driving force behind the modern Lizard People conspiracy theory, as well as perhaps the most successful professional conspiracy theorist of all time, David Vaughn Icke. Icke was a former popular sportscaster for the BBC and prominent Green Party member, his life changed, however, around 1990 when he started feeling some invisible presence which physically led him to a book called Mind to Mind, written by a psychic healer by the name of Betty Shine. Soon enough, he sought out Shine to see if she could shed a little light on how he might heal his arthritis and what the deal was with the strange presence he was encountering. After a few visits, Shine allegedly told him on March 29, 1990, that Ike was placed on Earth to work as the instrument of the spirit world, and they would be contacting him to use him as a conduit to help humanity. Shortly after this, the messages flooded in. In order to spare the Green Party the controversy he knew would follow when he revealed to the world what the spirit realm was telling him, in 1991 Ike decided to leave said political party. He then held a press conference alongside his wife, Linda Atherton, and his girlfriend, Deborah Shaw, announcing to the world that he was, in fact, the Son of Godhead, with Godhead described by Ike as infinite mind. Among other things, he would make a variety of bold predictions, such as that the world would experience a cataclysmic event in 1997, which would see such things as New Zealand disappearing into the sea. This would all culminate in the entire world ceasing to exist. He further revealed that all of this was told to him by spirit voices who were using him as a conduit to communicate to the people of Earth. Of course, revelations like these are going to stir a little bit of controversy and some mocking towards the man, but we'll find out what happened next when Weird Darkness returns. October is the anniversary of Weird Darkness, and we celebrate by raising funds to help people who suffer from depression. Chantel wrote in saying, I had fairly aggressive postpartum depression three years ago. I work as a reservist in the Canadian Armed Forces and full-time as a correctional officer. 
I didn't know about the Weird Darkness podcast when I was dealing with my postpartum. However, due to my past medical history and my two jobs that almost guarantee me to have some type of mental illness in the future, I am glad that there is a soft place to fall other than the usual government-funded sites. Chantel is right. The organizations that we're raising funds for this month, Seven Cups, iFred, and the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline are all funded by donors like you and me who understand the importance of these resources being available. You can make a donation now of any amount by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Or click the link in the show notes. I'm Taron Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. Have you seen the Monster Channel? It has horror hosts, B-horror movies, retro television commercials, and a whole lot more, and you can watch it anytime, absolutely free, 24-7, 365, on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Watch Party. Well, when we left, David Icke had made quite a few predictions such as the world would experience a cataclysmic event in 1997, New Zealand would disappear into the sea, this would culminate into the entire world ceasing to exist, and he even revealed all of this was told to him by spirit voices who were using him as a conduit to communicate to the people of Earth. And he also mentioned that he was son of the Godhead. While he'd expected controversy from these revelations, Apparently, the reality of people not only not believing him but actually mocking him quite openly across the country was too much at first for Ike. He stated, One of my very greatest fears as a child was being ridiculed in public. And there it was coming true. As a television presenter, I'd been respected. People come up to you in the street and shake your hand and talk to you in a respectful way. And suddenly, overnight, this was transformed into Ike's a nutter, I couldn't walk down any street in Britain without being laughed at. It was a nightmare. My children were devastated because their dad was a figure of ridicule. At one point, shortly after his infamous announcement to the world, many dozens of teens even went so far as to gather in front of his house, continually chanting, We want the Messiah! Give us a sign, David! Despite it all, Ike soldiered on anyway, writing several astoundingly well-reviewed books such as The Truth Shall Set You Free, The Truth Vibrations, The Children of the Matrix, The Biggest Secret, The Book That Will Change the World, Alice in Wonderland and the World Trade Center, and Infinite Love is the Only Truth, among many others, with the entire catalog having apparently sold a couple hundred thousand copies to date. On the side, Ike also sells merchandise, operates a surprisingly popular conspiracy theory website, and most lucratively of all, frequently gives public talks in front of crowds of thousands, in one instance in Australia apparently grossing a whopping 83,000 pounds or about $102,000 in ticket sales at a talk in Melbourne. As for lizard people, they are at the center of Ike's vast conspiracy theory, which pretty much forges elements from just about every prominent conspiracy theory into one master theory to rule them all. Noteworthy is that much of the modern mythos surrounding the lizard people Ike has challenged from the spirit realm bears shocking resemblance to the sci-fi stories that kicked off the whole lizard people idea in the first place, as well as seemingly borrowing from the aforementioned The Emerald Tablets, as well as Stitchin's works, among others. Not completely unoriginal, Ike has come up with a number of his own elements to add to the narrative, including claiming the lizard people use the moon which apparently is a spacecraft and interdimensional portal to protect a holographic reality to aid in controlling humans. In his own words, we are living in a dream world within a dream world, a matrix within the virtual reality universe, and it is being broadcast from the moon. Unless people force themselves to become fully conscious, their minds are the moon's mind. He later claimed that actually the rings of Saturn are where these signals originate with the moon itself merely amplifying and projecting them onto Earth. Which, I'm not going to lie, shape-shifting interdimensional lizard aliens invading Earth, using mind control, virtual reality, moon-sized spacecraft, and many other awesome technologies to take over the world, 
I'd watch that movie. Can we get somebody to sum up Ike's books into one coherent trilogy, add some awesome characters, and maybe get the Wachowskis to direct? Of course, in Ike's version of things, it is not Keanu Reeves who will save the world, but rather himself, the Son of Godhead, via him revealing the truth to the world and getting everyone to love one another. As Ike states, divide and rule is the bottom line of all dictatorships. Arab is turned against Jew, black against white, right against left. Unplugging from the Matrix means refusing to recognize these illusory fault lines. We are all one. I refuse to see a Jew as different from an Arab and vice versa. They are both expressions of the one and need to be observed and treated the same, none more or less important than the other. I refuse to see black people in terms that I would not see white, nor to see the left as I would not see the right. How could it be any different except when we believe the illusion of division is real? If we do that, the Matrix has us. He sums up, in a speech in 2012, if we want a world of love and peace, we have to be loving and peaceful with everyone, even people we don't like. In the end, that is, according to the spirit realm who is using Ike to communicate with us, the only way to defeat the lizard people? Starve them of our anxieties, fears, and anger, and give them only the positive energy of love. So to sum up, Lizard people in some form or another have been around seemingly as long as humans have been coming up with stories, with the modern incarnation mostly seeming to have been popularized by author Robert E. Howard, spreading through fiction from there, and ultimately adapted, among other works, by others, with this all culminating in the most prominent version of the Lizard People story created by the Son of Godhead, Britain's own David Icke. For full details, see his many books, which the Lizard People freely allow him to publish despite that the books reveal their ultra-secret plan in incredible detail and even out some of their most prominent members. Embalmed corpses are not an unheard-of tourist attraction. Several popes are on view at the Vatican, and visitors still flock to see Lenin's preserved body in Moscow's Red Square. Yet, however macabre, these corpses serve something of a historical purpose. But that's not quite the case with La Pascualita, a Mexican tourist attraction that has long had people wondering whether it's a mannequin or a corpse being used as one. La Pascualita is almost certainly more lifelike than any department store mannequin you've ever seen. Not only is her face astonishingly expressive, complete with thick eyelashes and a glassy-eyed gaze, but her hands were constructed with painstaking detail, and her legs even have varicose veins. In contrast to the blank, white mannequins that dominate shopping malls and whose only purpose is to show off the clothes they are dressed in, La Pasqualita's elaborate wedding dress is often only the second thing passers-by will take note of thanks to her eerily realistic features. People have indeed been taking note ever since La Pascualita first appeared in the window of a bridal store in Chihuahua, Mexico in 1930. The locals were supposedly immediately struck not only by the mannequin's lifelike appearance, but by the close resemblance she bore to the daughter of the shop owner, Pascuela Esparza. According to this story, the daughter was preparing to be married when she was tragically bitten by a black widow spider and succumbed to its poison on her wedding day. It wasn't long after her death that the mannequin appeared in the shop window, giving birth to the legend that it was no mannequin at all but the perfectly preserved body of the unlucky would-be bride. Over the years, customers have claimed that La Pascualita's eyes will follow them as they walk around the store or that they have turned around to find her suddenly in a different position. Her presence is rumored to even unnerve some of the shop workers, with one claiming, every time I go near Pasqualita, my hands break out in a sweat. Her hands are very realistic, and she even has varicose veins on her legs. I believe she's a real person, one shopper said. Another local legend claims that La Pasqualita is indeed just a mannequin, or at least started out that way. According to this version of the story, a visiting French magician became so entranced by the bridal mannequin that he would visit her window each night and bring her to life, dancing with her and bringing her around town before returning her to the storefront each morning. 
whatever her true origins, La Pascualita has become a local legend in her own right over the decades. The details of the mannequin's origins are almost impossible to confirm, and even the name Pascuala Esparza may have been an invention after the fact. It does seem improbable that an embalmed corpse could remain completely intact in the Mexican heat over the course of nine decades, but the current owner seems to know that La Pascualita is at least good for business. When asked for the truth about the famous mannequin in his storefront, he simply winked and replied, Is it true? I really couldn't say. A fear of being buried alive was quite real and common in the 18th and 19th century. So rampant was the concern that casket companies developed innovative coffins, offering a means of signaling for help should any client awake six feet under. In the mid-1700s, Hannah Beswick, a wealthy woman of Saul near Manchester, England, convinced her physician, Dr. Thomas White, not to bury her when she died, just in case she wasn't really dead. Rather than be thrown into the darkness of a box, she offered to bequeath Dr. White 25,000 pounds if he'd embalm her body and keep it above ground. When she passed in 1758, the physician discovered there was one condition upon which he could keep the money. He would have to look at her at least once a year with a witness. As described in a 1940 newspaper article, the doctor was a sensible fellow, and 25,000 pounds was not to be lost for the sake of the least inconvenience. So he had Madame Beswick embalmed and shut up in an old clock case. She lay there at the top of his house year after year, and once every year, the doctor and a lawyer went up to see her, removing the curtain which covered her face and looking down at the odd lady. They opened a bottle of wine after the touching little ceremony and forgot all about it till twelve months went by. Other reports claim that Dr. White visited the body more frequently, often with curious guests. Either way, this continued until his death, at which point Beswick's embalmed body was moved to the Manchester Natural History Museum there it became known as the Manchester Mummy. By 1868, interest in Beswick's body began to fade, and officials decided the eccentric woman who feared death was definitely dead. Her wish clearly granted, they decided it was finally time for her to be buried. When Weird Darkness returns, as we keep searching for extraterrestrial life hoping anyone is out there, we could be missing an important issue that few have considered. What if extraterrestrial life is indistinguishable from the laws of physics? We'll try to answer that question up next. We all know someone who struggles with depression, whether we know it or not. It's something that those who suffer tend to deal with in silence, in the shadows. But the organizations we are supporting with our annual Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser this month are working to make it easier for those in the darkness to come into the light, to find help, and to learn that they're not alone, that there are ways to overcome the darkness and live normal lives. I'm evidence of that myself. I, too, suffer from depression. Our goal is to raise at least 5000 this month, but the more we raise, the more people we can help to climb out of their own personal darkness. If you've not donated yet, or if you want to give again, or maybe you'd like to grab the link and share the fundraiser on your own social media and challenge others to give, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. The fundraiser ends on Halloween, so please give right now while you're thinking about it. WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. I'm Taron Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. Coming up in tonight's Sudden Death Overtime content, which you can hear only in the podcast, is one of the strangest unsolved murders in American history. How strange? Well, it includes a pig woman and a preacher. That's how strange. It's the still-unsolved Hall Mills murders of 1922. 
Also, Hannah Beswick was so frightened by the idea of being accidentally buried alive that she even told her doctor that upon her death, she was not to be buried, just in case they'd pronounce her deceased a bit too early. That was the beginning of her very strange afterlife. And haunted locations are so popular nowadays, it's almost impossible to keep a lid on it if you don't want the word to get out that your house, business, or even car is haunted. But then there's a hotel in Wales that is haunted, but no one seems to know about it. All of those stories and a whole lot more you'll be able to hear in the podcast version of tonight's radio show in the Sudden Death Overtime content, and I post that episode every Monday. As we keep searching for extraterrestrial life, hoping anyone is out there, we could be missing an important issue few have considered. What if extraterrestrial life is indistinguishable from the laws of physics? This intriguing theory has been put forward by an astrophysicist who suggested advanced alien life forms may be hiding in or even influencing dark matter and dark energy. Are aliens controlling dark matter, making them invisible to our technology? Dark matter, a mysterious substance that manifests itself through its gravitational pull, is still one of the greatest cosmological mysteries. The quest for dark matter is ongoing. No one knows what dark matter consists of, and no one has seen it, because it doesn't interact with the matter scientists know about. Scientists have previously suggested a mirror world may be hiding behind dark matter, but it's possible the question is even more complicated than we might think. Readers of science fiction are familiar with Arthur Clarke's three laws. One, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he's almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. Two, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Three, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. We're currently interested in law number three, that in our case can be interpreted as that extraterrestrial technology may be so advanced it's like magic looking through our human eyes. This is basically what Caleb Scharf, director of astrobiology at Columbia University, thinks. Scharf suggests that when searching for extraterrestrial life, we must consider some very extreme possibilities. Life in the universe may have evolved beyond our own waypoints of complexity and technology. As Scharf explained, if you're a civilization that has learned how to encode living systems in different substrates, all you need to do is build a normal matter-to-dark matter data transfer system, a dark matter 3D printer. Perhaps the mismatch of astronomical models and observations is evidence not just of self-interacting dark matter, but of dark matter that is being artificially manipulated. Or to take this a step further, perhaps the behavior of normal cosmic matter that we attribute to dark matter is brought on by something else altogether, a living state that manipulates luminous matter for its own purposes. Consider that at present we have neither identified the dark matter particles nor come up with a compelling alternative to our laws of physics that would account for the behavior of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Would an explanation in terms of life be any less plausible than a failure of established laws? Scharf's theory has naturally not been proven yet, but it's wise to consider he could be onto something important. We've previously discussed aliens may exist in forms we cannot conceive and extraterrestrial life may be beyond human understanding. Just because they are invisible to us doesn't mean they're not out there. Russian cosmologist Vyacheslav I. Dukoshev of Moscow's Institute for Nuclear Research of the Russian Academy of Sciences suggested super-aliens may already be living inside supermassive black holes. Scientists have also proposed black holes could be homes to plasma aliens. Extraterrestrial life may be much stranger than we can possibly imagine, and with our current, limited knowledge of alien forms in the cosmos, one should be careful before dismissing a theory no matter how far-fetched it might sound. Anything is possible, isn't it? As Scharf explains, if we're willing to admit that extraterrestrials are different from us and could be much more advanced than our modern society, then we should also consider the possibility that they could be behind some of the strange phenomena we see in the universe. Basically, what Scharf is suggesting is that aliens have acquired sophisticated knowledge 
allowing them to encode themselves in subatomic particles, and if true, the subject of dark matter just became even more interesting and complicated. Thanks for listening. If you missed any part of tonight's show, or if you want to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen. Not only will you hear a copy of tonight's show, you'll also receive daily episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash listen, or search for Weird Darkness wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow Weird Darkness on social media by visiting the contact social page on the website. And please tell others about Weird Darkness who love the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. Doing that helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. If you'd like to be a part of the show, you can send in your own paranormal experiences by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com. You can also email me anytime, Darren at WeirdDarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I'll upload to the Weird Darkness website immediately after tonight's show has ended. The Reptilian Conspiracy is from Today I Found Out, and Gemma Collins and the Lizard People is by Lucy Needham, La Pasqualita is by Gina DeMuro, and Does Dark Matter Explain Extraterrestrial Life was written by Cynthia McKenzie. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Romans 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And a final thought. Without rain, nothing grows. Embrace the storms in your life. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey Weirdos, keep listening! Hour 2 of the Weird Darkness radio show is coming up! October is the anniversary of Weird Darkness, and we celebrate by raising funds through our Overcoming the Darkness campaign to help people who suffer from depression. Jamie gave to the Overcoming the Darkness campaign a few years ago, and when she did, she left a message saying, I live in the smallest of small towns, and Weird Darkness makes me smile, sometimes uncontrollably. I suffered from depression for the first time after my father passed away in 2013. It was awful. I didn't understand at first what I was feeling. It's debilitating. Also, my child suffers from extreme depression, and I didn't know how to help. It makes you feel useless. Well, of course, he loves your podcast, too, since I shared it with him. Thanks for all you do. To other listeners, come on, people. More donations. We should be able to surpass the goal. Donate, donate, donate. <laughs> well, I can't really add anything to what Jamie just said, except to say that you can donate, donate, donate by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. It was 1976. Four artists were enjoying a canoeing trip on the Allagash Waterway when their pleasant evening was turned into a nightmare. A nightmare of missing time and alien abduction. At first, only missing time, and then forgetfulness. Finally, a connection was made, and little by little, the details became known in what is now considered one of the most compelling and well-documented cases of alien abduction in history. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… Serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer was murdered while in prison, and there was no one more deserving of it. Have you ever had a déjà vu experience? 
It's the feeling or impression that you've already witnessed or experienced a current situation. Why does it happen? The theories are mind-blowing. But first, one of the most researched cases of multiple alien abduction occurred in August 1976 in the state of Maine. The Allagash Waterway incident is still considered one of the best documented alien abductions in the history of UFOs and extraterrestrials. We'll look at this and other cases of alien abduction. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com and click on Contact Social to follow Weird Darkness on social media. And also on the website, you can find the daily Weird Darkness podcast, which comes out seven days per week. You can enter monthly contests, find Weird Darkness merchandise, and more. You can even send in your own true story of something paranormal that's happened to you or someone you know. You can find it all at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Considered by most the flagship case of alien abduction, a husband and wife, Betty and Barney Hill, taking a short vacation in 1961, see a bright object in the evening sky. They're stopped on the road by aliens and become part of an abduction case for the ages. Regressive hypnosis plays a major role in unveiling a dark secret, a secret of alien abduction, and medical experimentation. I covered their story in a previous episode of Weird Darkness, which I will link to in the show notes. While the story gets a lot of attention from ufologists and curiosity seekers, it is by no means the only well-documented case of being abducted by extraterrestrials. I also recently covered the abduction of Betty Andreasen, which I will also link to in the show notes. In South Ashburnham, Massachusetts, on the night of January 25, 1967, one of the most celebrated cases of UFO abduction began. Betty Andreasen was working in her kitchen while her seven children, mother, and father were in the living room. Suddenly, a bright light invades the house. From the yard, alien creatures are seen hopping toward the house. It is one of the strangest abduction cases on record. Other abduction cases include 1967, as Patrolman Herbert Shermer passes through the intersection of Highway 6 and Highway 63 on the outskirts of Ashland, he saw what appeared to be red lights on a large truck stopped a short way down Highway 63. He decided to check it out. He drove the short distance down 63 and stopped with his headlights shining on the object. According to Shermer, the object was definitely not a truck. The red lights that he had seen were blinking through the oval portholes of a metallic, oval-shaped object. 1969. Only seven and a half years after the Betty and Barney Hill story, the New England states would again host an alien abduction. Buff Ledge in Vermont would be the site of a visitation by four UFOs, which would make revolutionary aerial maneuvers. Two counselors would suffer missing time and seek professional help. The Pascagoula abduction in 1973. Fifteen different people see a large, silver UFO fly over a housing project in St. Tammany Parish, New Orleans, Louisiana. Only a scant 24 hours later, Calvin Parker and Charles Hickerson would unwillingly take a journey into the unknown. Strange creatures with claw-like hands abduct them. 1975. Alamogordo, New Mexico it'd be the location of a UFO encounter involving Air Force Sergeant Charles L. Moody, August 13, 1975. Moody was in the desert observing a meteor shower at about 1.15 in the morning when he saw a glowing metallic disc-shaped object falling toward the ground about 300 feet away. Also in 1975, as seven loggers began their journey home, 
they see a luminous object shaped like a flattened disk. All of the men agreed that Travis Walton, captivated by the sight, left the truck to get a closer look. A blue beam hits him, throwing him to the ground. He would vanish for five days and soon begin telling his story of the inside of an extraterrestrial spacecraft. They even made a big-budget movie about the incident. 1976. While America was still buzzing over the Travis Walton abduction, three women are abducted near Stanford, Kentucky. Heading for Houstonville on Highway 78, they suddenly see a bright red object in the clear night sky, turning a nice evening into a night of terror. I still have many more true stories of alien abduction and sightings when Weird Darkness returns. Weird Darkness is celebrating its eighth birthday this month, and our way of celebrating is to raise money for organizations that help people who struggle with depression, anxiety, and thoughts of suicide and self-harm. It's called Overcoming the Darkness, and you can make a donation right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. A gift of any amount will bring us that much closer to our goal, and your donation helps that many more people who are affected by depression, so no gift is too small. Our goal is to raise at least $5,000 this month. If you've not donated yet, or if you'd like to give again, or maybe you'd like to grab the link and share the fundraiser on your own social media and challenge others to give, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. The fundraiser ends on Halloween, so please give right now while you're thinking about it. WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Welcome back to Weird Darkness, I'm Darren Marlar. If you or someone you know struggles with depression or dark thoughts, I'd like to recommend the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There I have gathered numerous free resources to help you fight depression, including the Seven Cups app, the Suicide and Crisis Hotline, ifred.org, and more. These resources are absolutely free, and they are there when you need them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. We continue now with more true, strange encounters with aliens, including abductions. 1979. Robert Taylor was 61 years old at the time that he had the most unusual encounter of his life. He'd worked as a forester all of his adult life in the Deshmont Woods, located in Livingston, West Lothian, Scotland. On the morning of Friday, November 9, 1979, he and his red setter rounded a corner on a forest trail and saw an unbelievable sight, a UFO. The object appeared to be hovering just above the forest floor. It made no sound and seemed to be motionless. 1985. Writer Whitley Stryber would be abducted by aliens while in his isolated cabin in upstate New York over the Christmas season. He encountered four types of alien beings which subjected him to medical tests. 1987. A policeman named Philip Spencer claims to have taken a picture of an alien being. If this is true, it is one of only a few in existence. The scary Ilkley Moor in Yorkshire, England, would hold the secret of the strange creature encountered one early morning. Godfrey was frightened but ran after the creature, taking one photograph. Through hypnosis, he would recall an odd flying object and an alien abduction. 1988. John Salter Jr. and his son are abducted by benevolent aliens one of the few cases in which alien abduction turned out to be a good thing. Medical experimentation has a happy ending with improved health for both abductees. 1989. An extremely compelling case of alien abduction is that of Linda Napolitano. Napolitano has claimed that she was abducted by the so-called Greys, who floated her from a closed bedroom window into a hovering UFO. As time went by, several different eyewitnesses came forward to substantiate her claims. Several bystanders, including a well-known politician, actually see the incident. The case was also covered in Weird Darkness recently. 
I'll link to that in the show notes. In August 1993, 27-year-old Kelly Cahill, her husband, and three children were driving home after a visit to their friend's house. Their routine journey would soon become a harrowing trip into an unknown world of strange beings that occupied space but were void of color as we know it. The Dandafong foothills near Victoria, Australia, would be forever linked to one of the strangest creatures in ufological archives. 1997 One of the weirdest cases reported to the Welsh Federation of Independent Ufologists is the multiple sighting of UFOs on the same night, except one family got too close for comfort and were apparently abducted. The strange and disturbing events began to unfold when, for several nights, an elderly man living in Little Orm Conway was troubled by what he called frightening beams of light over the Great Orm. All cases are considered the most well-documented in ufology. And then there was Allagashi Waterway. One of the most researched cases of multiple alien abduction occurred in August 1976 in the state of Maine. The Allagash Waterway abduction is an integral piece of the alien abduction puzzle. This case gained worldwide attention when it was dramatized in an episode of television's Unsolved Mysteries. Twin brothers Jack and Jim Weiner, along with their friends Chuck Rack and Charlie Foltz, would be participants in an event involving a UFO sighting, missing time, and medical procedures performed by beings unknown. Not only were the four men fishing buddies, but they were all art students, having met at the Massachusetts College of Art. They set out for what should have been an uneventful, relaxing fishing trip. That was not to be. After being on the waterway for a time, the four fishermen had canoed to Eagle Lake. They had no luck there and returned to the bank. As they were beginning to get low on provisions, they decided to do a little fishing at night. To be on the safe side, they built a roaring fire on the bank to use as a landmark in case they became turned around on the lake. After a short period of time, all four of the men's attention was drawn to a large, bright light in the sky over the lake. It was much more brilliant than a star. Only a couple of hundred yards away, the UFO was hovering over a group of trees. The object began to move and change colors from red to green, then to a whitish yellow. The men were watching the object in awe, wondering what it might be. At this time, they estimated it to be about 80 feet in diameter. Charlie Fultz decided to signal to it with his flashlight. At once, the UFO began to move toward them. They were being watched. The object silently made its way toward the men. They began a dash to the shore, paddling as fast as they could. A light from the object beamed down and engulfed the men in their canoe. The next thing they knew, they were back on the bank of the lake. Fultz again signaled the UFO with his flashlight, but this time it rose upward and departed from their view. Then they noticed that the large fire that they had started only a short time ago was already burned to ashes, which should have taken several hours. What had happened to the men? It was obvious to the four buddies that they were missing several hours of time. Little was said between them at the time. They packed up their belongings and headed back home. As time went by, the events of that terrible night on Allagash would begin to have an effect on their lives. The first man to suffer was Jack Weiner. He began to have awful nightmares of strange beings with long necks and large heads. He could see himself being examined while the other three men sat idly by. The strange humanoid beings in Jack's nightmares were described as having metallic, glowing eyes with no lids. Their hands were like an insect's, with only four fingers. There are similarities between this event and the Betty Andreasen abduction. The other three men also were having dreams of a similar nature. Finally, in 1988, Jim Weiner decided to visit a UFO conference, which was hosted by author Raymond Fowler. When the conference ended, he talked to Fowler and related his remarkable encounter on the Allagash Waterway. Fowler was very experienced in dealing with the exact problem that Jim, his brother, and the two other fishermen were facing. He suggested to Jim that all four of the men undergo regressive hypnosis, a type of hypnosis that recovers lost memories. After the four men completed their sessions, it was determined that all of them had been abducted by strange beings from the UFO that engulfed them and their canoe on the Allagash Waterway. 
Part of the abduction involved very sensitive personal issues of taking of fluid, even semen samples, and other humiliating medical tests. The men all recalled the abduction procedure. Some would recall one part of it and some another part, but when combined, they showed a complete picture of a typical alien abduction. Since the men were all artists, they were able to draw striking depictions of the examination room, the instruments used, and the aliens. This information would be invaluable to those who study the phenomenon of alien abduction. The four friends would also take lie detector tests, which they all passed, further verifying their encounter. You can get more Weird Darkness seven days a week through the Weird Darkness podcast. You can find it wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can visit weirddarkness.com slash listen, and you can find a list of all the apps where you can listen to the show. It's weirddarkness.com slash listen. Coming up, the L8 blimp spotted a possible oil spill and reported it back to base. While circling the area, witnesses saw the airship unexpectedly glide higher and higher out of sight. But when it was seen again later, it was flying with no one on board. We'll look at the mystery of the L-8 blimp. Plus, serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. He was murdered while in prison, and I'm sure you'd agree nobody was more deserving of it. We'll look at the murder of a serial murderer. These stories when Weird Darkness Returns. In the meantime, if you'd like to catch me in person somewhere, I'm taking the Weird Darkness SUV all over the nation to conferences, conventions, festivals, expos, and more. You can find out where I'm going to be in the weeks and months to come and even suggest places for me to go, if you'd like, by visiting WeirdDarkness.com and then clicking on Road Trip. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Road Trip. October is the anniversary of Weird Darkness, and we celebrate by raising funds to help people who suffer from depression. Catherine sent in a donation during a previous Overcoming the Darkness campaign and said, I wish your podcast had been around several years ago. My brother would have loved it, and maybe he wouldn't have felt so defeated. Rob committed suicide in October 2012, leaving devastated family and friends. I hope this donation gets the help and support they need and understand others want them to stay in their lives. We all know someone who's been affected by depression or suicide, and Catherine's message is the perfect reason for you to give whatever you can this month during our Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser, where 100% of the proceeds are donated to organizations that help people struggling with depression. You can learn more about these organizations and make a donation of any amount at WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. Jeffrey Dahmer murdered 17 men and boys over a period of 13 years before he was caught in 1991. He was a serial killer who openly admitted his crimes. He detailed his kills and his engagement in necrophilia, along with the cannibalistic nature of his crimes, to the horror of police in over 60 hours of interviews. This was a man whose Wisconsin apartment was full of the remains of his victims, with four severed heads found in his kitchen and a further seven skulls found in his bedroom. Diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, Dahmer received 15 life sentences after a two-week trial in 1994. A further life sentence came three months later in Ohio for the murder of his first victim, Stephen Hicks. The state of Wisconsin abolished the death penalty in 1853, saving Dahmer from death, but he was destined to spend the rest of his life behind bars. However, this was not to be his fate. Jeffrey Dahmer was beaten to death in prison two years later by fellow inmate Christopher Scarver, who has claimed he found Dahmer unrepentant for his crimes. 
Scarver, a convicted murderer himself, broke his silence on why he killed Dahmer in 2015, an attack that has taken him from the shadows and into the spotlight for being the person who murdered one of America's most notorious serial killers. Born in 1960 in Wisconsin, Dahmer was 34 years old when he was killed in 1994. He'd been called the Milwaukee Cannibal and the Milwaukee Monster for his crimes and was convicted on a long list of charges including murder, indecent exposure, and disorderly conduct. Jeffrey Dahmer was 18 when he committed his first murder in 1978 after picking up hitchhiker Stephen Mark Hicks. Hicks went willingly with Dahmer on the pretense of drinks and listening to music. Dahmer did not want Hicks to leave. He hit him over the head with a dumbbell and then strangled him. He dismembered Hicks' body and buried the remains in the backyard of his family home where he was living at the time. The flesh was dissolved in acid and the bones crushed to ensure he had gotten rid of the body entirely. By the time of his arrest, Dahmer was living in his own apartment with less chance of his activities being discovered. In July 1991, Dahmer invited three men back to his home. Only one accepted his offer, 32-year-old Tracy Edwards. Once at the apartment, Dahmer forcibly tried to take nude photos of Edwards while threatening him with a knife. Edwards tried to befriend Dahmer and please him, realizing his life was in danger. Edwards found the right moment when Dahmer was distracted, punched him, and ran out the door. He flagged down a police car still with a handcuff on his right wrist and told the officers of what had happened. Unable to remove the handcuff, Edwards agreed to return to the apartment with them to get the key. When in the apartment, the officers noted a large knife, pictures of dismembered bodies, and a foul odor and arrested Dahmer. Their subsequent search of his apartment revealed the horrific scenes in which Dahmer was living in. Officers found an array of body parts and bones of his victims all around the apartment, in the fridge, on the stove, in plant pots, and in his bedroom. Never before had police officers stumbled across such a crime scene, and they are unlikely to ever again. Jeffrey Dahmer was unique in that he was very open about his crimes when questioned. He seemed almost relieved to be caught and explained his motives for the killing and the keeping of the remains. He engaged in necrophilia and cannibalism, experimenting with each new victim. He told stunned officers he had a compulsion to kill, a need to keep someone with him and not allow them to leave no matter what it took. His acts after their death were to fulfill his fantasies and keep them with him for as long as possible. At his trial, the defense argued that Dahmer was insane, while the prosecution argued he was calculating and fully aware of his actions, although both sides agreed on borderline personality disorder. Expert witnesses argued over his state of mind, his compulsion to kill, his motives, and his methods. At the end of two exhausting weeks for all involved, Dahmer was declared sane, and not to be suffering from a mental disorder at the time of each of the murders, and he was sent to the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin, to begin his sentence. At around the same time, Christopher Scarver found himself checking in to the Columbia Correctional Institution. Scarver was serving life without parole for the murder of a supervisor at the training program where he was working as a trainee carpenter in Wisconsin. He had shot Steve Loam in the head, on June 1, 1990, after demanding cash. Mental health issues had been prominent during his time in prison, with a number of mental health assessments and a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Up until 2015, Scarver had never talked about the events of the murder of Jeffrey Dahmer and another man at the prison, Jesse Anderson. In an interview with the New York Post in 2015, he spoke about what led him to take Dahmer's life. Dahmer was reportedly in solitary confinement for his first year in prison, and Scarver claims he was not liked in the prison, regularly clashed with other prisoners to the extent that when he came out of solitary, he was always escorted by officers wherever he went. The behavior which bothers Scarver most, he claims, was Dahmer's habit of taunting other prisoners at mealtimes by creating limb shapes from his food and using tomato sauce as blood, leaving his creations for people to find. According to Scarver, Dahmer repeatedly played such sick practical jokes which were not appreciated by other prisoners or guards. Scarver was particularly disturbed by Dahmer's crimes and the details of what he had done to his victims before and after their death. In November of 1994, 
Dahmer was left alone by the guards, who, along with Christopher Scarver and a third prisoner, Jesse Anderson, were tasked with cleaning the bathrooms of the gymnasium. Scarver felt Dahmer and Anderson were laughing at him, sniggered at a joke after poking him in the back. Their time alone gave Scarver opportunity to confront Dahmer about a newspaper report, asking whether the details of what he had done to his victims were correct. According to Scarver, Dahmer tried to flee, clearly sensing danger. Scarver attacked Dahmer with a metal bar, crushing his skull. He then moved on to Anderson, attacking him in the same manner. Dahmer was killed almost instantly from extensive head injuries, while Jesse Anderson died two days later. Christopher Scarver claims he spent 16 years in solitary after the killings and complained of cruel and unusual punishment, bringing a civil rights action suit against the Wisconsin prison. The suit was initially dismissed, but upon appeal to the U.S. court, Scarver and a number of other prisoners with mental health problems were ordered to be relocated. In recent years, Scarver has been in talks for a book about the killing of Jeffrey Dahmer, clearly taking advantage of his newfound fame. Scarver has also claimed he was left alone with Dahmer on purpose, with guards hoping something would happen as they hated Dahmer and wanted him dead, although he would not elaborate further on such claims. Christopher Scarver is now serving a further two life sentences for the murders of Jeffrey Dahmer and Jesse Anderson. For many involved in the Dahmer case, the lack of the death penalty in Wisconsin was a disappointment. In many other states, Jeffrey Dahmer would have most certainly been put to death for his crimes. For them, his murder just two years after his imprisonment may have been the justice they were looking for. For others, Jeffrey Dahmer has been released from spending the rest of his natural life in prison as punishment for the 17 lives he so brutally took. It began as a routine military mission. On August 16, 1942, one of these submarine missions took off from Treasure Island with two crew members, Ernest Cody and Charles Adams. The blimp they were piloting was the L-8, which had made such missions before. Both men were experienced in these reconnaissance missions, and nothing but a routine trip was expected. The destination of the early morning trip was the Farallon Islands, about 30 miles off the coast of San Francisco. The blimp would circle the islands and then return to base. One hour into the flight, L-8 radioed back to Treasure Island that they had detected a possible oil spill and that they were going to investigate further. Two ships saw the L-8 blimp circling the Farallon Islands at approximately 10.30 that morning. A Pan Am airline saw it on course at 10.50. Soon after, however, a witness said it glided upwards further into the sky. Its whereabouts for the following hour are unknown. The next appearance was around noon when people on a beach near the city of Daly City were thrown into a panic as the L-8 crashed into some rocks along the shore and then bounced back up into the sky. The blimp would finally come to rest on a busy street in the city. Running to the wreckage, the potential rescuers were shocked to find the blimp's cockpit empty. The investigation looked for clues once it had been firmly determined that neither Cody nor Adams were anywhere on board. Investigators noticed that one of the doors had been propped open. This was unusual, but all of the necessary equipment was in working order. The parachutes and life raft were still stowed in their correct places. Two of the life vests were missing, but that didn't seem to indicate anything unusual, as it was policy for men to wear them whenever a mission took them over water. The biggest mystery was why neither of the men had radioed for help during whatever crisis had ensued, as the radio was in perfect order. All sorts of theories were proposed. A fight broke out between the two men and they fell out that open door. They were somehow captured by the enemy. Even the old standby of UFOs was suggested. Not a trace of Cody or Adams was ever found. October is birthday month for Weird Darkness, and this makes eight years of doing the show. But while it's our birthday, we want the gifts to go to those who help people who suffer from depression, 
anxiety, or thoughts of suicide or self-harm. That's what our Overcoming the Darkness campaign every October is all about. You can bring hope to those who are lost in the darkness. You can make a donation right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. I'll close out the fundraiser at the end of October and announce how much we raised. Our goal is to raise at least 5000 this month, but the more we raise, the more people we can help to climb out of their own personal darkness. If you've not donated yet, or if you'd like to give again, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. The fundraiser ends on Halloween, so please, give right now while you're thinking about it. WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to tell you about the L8 blimp, so I'll put that in tonight's Sudden Death Overtime content in the podcast, but I think I do have time to tell you about the story of Blood Town Forest. There are two sides to every story and two sides to every person. There's the story you get publicly, with all of its embellishments and inaccuracies, and the story that's actually true. It's just like the public persona a person puts out and the private individual with his or her own thoughts and motivations. Such is the case with Arthur Blood and Lancaster Town Forest. Talk to some people, and you'll hear the story of a kindly old gentleman who donated his private land so his town could have a public wooded area to explore. Talk to other people, and you'll hear the tale of a murderous psychopath who slashed his way through the local populace after he lost his mind. Which story is true? Well, we may never know. One thing is clear, though, Blood Town Forest will always be a great place to take a hike. This is a story that's best to start off at the final result. Camp or hike through Blood Forest and you might just run into a few victims of Arthur, or Old Man Blood, as he has come to be known. There are reports of disembodied voices echoing through the night air, and if you are lucky enough to hear them, you might also be treated to soft whispers and blood-curdling screams in the forest. There are also plenty of people who have claimed to see full-on apparitions and poltergeists patrolling the heavily wooded areas. Rocks and sticks will fly through the air, and these evil entities will do everything they can to ruin your day. This is said to include tripping hikers and throwing camping equipment all around the woods. It seems that you just can't let your guard down and have a peaceful day in nature without some tortured soul causing you drama. Of course, you have to actually find the place before you can deal with the spooks. It's located right off of Brockelman Road in Lancaster. The entrance is difficult to find if you don't know where you're going, and maybe that's by design. You can't have a murder spree in the forest if you can't find a place to park first. Blood Forest itself was donated to the town of Lancaster in 1946 by the titular Arthur W. Blood. It was added to land that the town already owned to create the Arthur W. Blood Town Forest. Yet another parcel from the opposite side of Brockelman Road was added later on, and the whole thing was renamed Town Forest. Or at least that's what they want you to think. Details are tough to come by when it comes to the actual reasons for all of those apparitions and poltergeists being there in the first place. The legend goes that Arthur Blood lost his mind and started preying on anyone who dared to venture into his donated woods. He would stalk them, attack them, and murder them with an axe or some equally horrifying death implement. Then he'd hang these lifeless corpses from the trees throughout the woods. Just think Jason Voorhees and add an artistic streak for the hangings. These murders persisted until well after Arthur's time on this plane of existence. Old Man Blood passed away in 1951, but the final murder happened in the 70s. An innocent young couple parked for the night to camp in the wilderness. They'd never make it very far, and were both found murdered by their car in the coming days. Arthur himself would have been in his 90s and well past his prime killing years at this point. These two unfortunates simply stand as one more bloody atrocity in a forest rife with them. All of this makes for great folklore. You get a mentally unstable hermit, you get the scary woods, and you even get the ghosts. The problem comes when you try to confirm any of these stories. There's simply none of it to be had. There are no records of bodies being found swinging from trees. 
There are no files on a crazy Arthur Blood being investigated or committed to an asylum. There aren't even any police files on a deceased couple found in the 1970s. Sure, there was a lot going on in that decade, what with the bell-bottoms and disco music, but two people found murdered by their car would have at least made the papers. That's especially true if that murder happens in a supposedly haunted forest. In all of the stories about the forest, it's never mentioned that Arthur was also married to Sarah Blood the whole time he was slicing and dicing up the population. She also ended up outliving him by seven years. Even if she couldn't bring up the fact that she was married to the world's worst Christmas tree decorator while he was alive, nothing would have stopped her from coming forward after his demise. It all comes together to give a story that's much more based in fantasy than in reality. It's next to impossible to know that a place called Blood Forest exists without coming up with a creepy explanation, and new tales about ghosts in the area persist to this day. Look into the history of Town Forest, and you're going to come across a lot of, well, basically fan fiction about it. These are stories that have been passed down and reiterated so much that the strands of actual truth behind them have long since disappeared. Take WorcesterTalk.com, for example. There's a 2004 message board topic with locals claiming everything from Indian burial grounds in the forest to creepy mansions and executions. The main legend behind it has the murders perpetrated in the 1800s by some man. That's quite a departure from old man blood in the 1950s, but the tales persist and will be forever reinvented with every generation of new storytellers. So who's to be believed in all this? You can probably take the word of Tim Kastner, who serves on the Town Forest Committee for Lancaster and had something to say about it in 2017. Quote, the forest was first established in the late 1940s, when a local farmer by the name of Arthur Blood donated land to the town. The fact that it's called Blood Town Forest has inspired a significant number of internet postings, none of which have a shred of evidence to them. The most prominent was that Arthur Blood was some kind of crazy guy who slaughtered people and hung them up in the trees. This is particularly sad in light of the fact that this is a guy whose family had been farmers in town for over a hundred years and volunteered and gave all sorts of things back to the community." Unquote. That's pretty much all there is to it. Someone liked his community enough to donate his own land to it, and then a bunch of people made up stories. So go hiking, go for a nature walk, or just go and breathe in the fresh air without the fear of disembowelment. You might just want to make sure you're not too close to any low-hanging limbs, though. You know, just to be safe. Thanks for listening. If you missed any part of tonight's show or if you want to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen. Not only will you hear a copy of tonight's show, you'll also receive daily episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash listen, or just search for Weird Darkness wherever you listen to podcasts. And again, I will have the mystery of the L8 blimp story in the Sudden Death Overtime content of tonight's podcast, which we'll upload on Monday. You can follow Weird Darkness on social media by visiting the contact social page on the website. And please tell others about Weird Darkness who love the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. Doing that helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. If you'd like to be a part of the show, you can send in your own paranormal experiences by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com. You can also email me anytime at Darren at WeirdDarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I'll upload to the Weird Darkness website immediately after tonight's show has ended. The story of Bloodtown Forest was written by Ed Sweeney from Slightly Odd Fitchburg. The murder of a serial murderer is by Fiona Guy for Crime Traveler. The Allagash Incident is by Billy Booth for Live About. And Deja Vu All Over Again is by Cynthia McKenzie for Message to Eagle. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 2 verse 11. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. And a final thought. Learn to sit back and observe, 
not everything needs a reaction. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Don't go anywhere, weirdos, because Sudden Death Over Time is up next. Every October, we take the month and raise funds for organizations that help people who struggle with depression. It's called Overcoming the Darkness. AZ wrote in a few years ago talking about our Overcoming the Darkness campaign. I can tell everyone that no matter what you think, there is a way out of depression. And I'm living proof. I spent 30 plus years in a funk so deep, there are large chunks of my life I simply don't remember. At times, it was just a feeling of sadness and impending doom. I thought of ways out, many times. I finally got tired of barely being alive. I talked to a doctor and began taking antidepressants. Now I rarely get depressed or stressed, and I no longer find myself not dreading tomorrow. This is why our Overcoming the Darkness campaign is so important. It supports organizations that help people who struggle with depression so that they too can start looking forward to tomorrow instead of dreading today. Please donate today, right now if you can. Go to WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. One of the strangest unsolved murders in American history was discovered on September 14, 1922, near New Brunswick, New Jersey. The murders would capture the attention of the morbid curious all over the New York area and would take years to untangle. In the end, it would remain unsolved. The events were set in motion on the warm evening of September 14 when two young lovers, Raymond Schneider, 23, and Pearl Bomber, 15, were out for a stroll along secluded Darussi's Lane, now Franklin Boulevard, in Franklin Township. Looking for a spot for a late-night tryst, they were disappointed to find that another couple had already beaten them to their favorite place under a sprawling crabapple tree. But there was something wrong with the couple. They weren't moving. The older man and a young woman, both well-dressed, were lying next to one another, carefully touching, but as Raymond looked closer, the moonlight revealed that the man had a bullet hole in his head. The woman had been shot in the face three times. Throat had also been cut from ear to ear, spraying the ground and their clothing with blood. An autopsy later revealed her tongue had been cut out. Raymond and Pearl fled the scene and went to the nearest house to call the police. When the authorities arrived, they began trying to piece together what had happened. Although the man and woman had been killed nearby, they appeared to have been carefully placed under the crabapple tree. They were touching each other, the man's hat was placed over his face. Their clothing had been hurriedly pulled on and buttoned wrong, leading the investigators to believe that they had been naked when killed and then dressed by someone else. Scattered about on the grass were a number of love letters that the woman had apparently written to the man and bore her signature. A business card belonging to the man had been propped up against his shoe so that the officers would have no trouble identifying the victims. The man was Reverend Edward Wheeler Hall, the rector of St. John the Evangelist Church in New Brunswick. The dead woman in his arms was Mrs. Eleanor Mills, the young choir director of the church. From the looks of the letters that she had written to him, "'Oh, honey, I am fiery today. Burning, flaming love. It seems ages since I saw my babykin's body and kissed every bit of you,' it appeared that the preacher and the choir director had been lovers for some time. Reverend Hall had become the pastor of the church in 1909. Two years later, he'd married a wealthy local woman named Frances Stevens. She was seven years older than the handsome clergyman and was considered a spinster. Rumors had it that Hall married for money, but the marriage seemed to be stable and a peaceful one. The new Mrs. Hall's family was a rather peculiar one, though. Willie Stevens, her brother, was a strange, unkempt, and eccentric man. He wore shabby clothing and grew his hair long and wild. Although quite rich, he was incapable of managing his own fortune and he was given an allowance each week. He lived in the family mansion with his sister and Reverend Hall and kept himself busy by becoming a self-taught but recognized expert on entomology and botany. 
He also volunteered as a fireman, and occasionally, when he became bored, he would start a large fire in his backyard and then run into the house. He would return in his fireman's uniform and extinguish the flames. Mrs. Stevens' other brother, Henry, was a little better adjusted when compared to his sibling and lived about sixty miles away in his own home. He was a quiet man, who managed his family's investments and pursued his great passions of hunting and target shooting. He also maintained close contact with a cousin and extended member of the immediate family, Henry Carpenter. Henry was an attorney and a member of the New York Stock Exchange. He was a frequent visitor to the Stevens estate and acted as a troubleshooter for the family. The murdered woman, Eleanor Mills, was married to James Mills, who was employed as a sexton and handyman at Reverend Hall's church. He knew his wife had some sort of relationship with Hall but assumed that it was one based on religion and a love of music. He knew that they'd often have dinner together but never suspected an affair. And neither apparently did Mrs. Hall. She had befriended Eleanor to the extent that the older woman was almost a mother figure to her. She often took her shopping for new clothing and always made sure that she was invited to the finest social affairs. Shortly before Eleanor's death, Mrs. Hall had even paid for the young woman's appendectomy. Not long after the bodies were discovered, news of the murders began to spread. Mrs. Hall learned of her husband's death when a reporter called and asked for details. She hung up on him without comment. As crowds began to gather at the murder site, the officers and authorities began a strange battle over jurisdiction of the case. No one wanted responsibility for it. It turned out that the bodies were found just inside the Somerset County line, although both of the victims resided in Middlesex County. Each county prosecutor insisted that the case belonged to the other one. It would literally be years before the matter was entirely settled. While all this bickering was taking place, the Stevens family troubleshooter, Henry Carpenter, arrived at the scene with another attorney, viewed the bodies, and then left, almost unnoticed. Officers on the scene recovered several 32 caliber shells, but they managed to find little else in the way of clues. Unfortunately, crowds of curiosity seekers who came to the scene began walking away with souvenirs, ripping bark and leaves from the crabapple tree and pulling up large chunks of grass. Onlookers dipped handkerchiefs in the bloody grass, hoping for a gruesome remembrance. Finally, the police decided to take the bodies to the Somerset County morgue before they too were carried away. As the investigation began, detectives began digging deeper into the case and interviewing everyone involved in any way. According to Mrs. Hall, she last saw her husband at 7.30 p.m. on the night of the murders when he left the house on business. She was disturbed when he did not return that night and went to the church looking for him the next day. She found Mr. Mills there and, in the course of their conversations, realized that neither of their spouses had come home the previous night. In Mill's statement, he too agreed that his wife had left the house around 7.30 p.m. She did not tell him where she was going, and later that night, he went to bed. Around 2.30 a.m., he awoke and realized that his wife was not home. He dressed himself and their two small children and went to the church to search for Eleanor. He didn't find her there and returned home to sleep fitfully the rest of the night. Several other witnesses stated that they had seen Mrs. Hall leave the mansion around 2.30 a.m. on the night in question with her brother Willie. When confronted with this, she admitted that she did go out that night looking for her husband, but when she arrived at the church, she saw that the lights were out. She assumed that Reverend Hall was visiting a sick parishioner, and so she drove to the Mills house. When she saw that the lights were out there, too, she and Willie returned home. Detectives were suspicious of the stories told by both Mrs. Hall and by James Mills, but they had alibis that could not be broken. There was nothing to suggest that they were lying, but investigators felt certain that someone was. But who? After weeks of dead ends in the murder case, a new lead was discovered. The clues came from the account of a woman named Mrs. Jane Gibson. She was a hog farmer who had been given the colorful nickname of the pig woman. She came forward and told the police that she had seen members of the Stevens family kill Reverend Hall and Eleanor Mills near the apple tree. During the grand jury investigation, though, her story changed a little. She could not say under oath that it had been Mrs. Hall, Willie Stevens, Henry Stevens, and Henry Carpenter 
who committed the murders, but she had seen the crime. The night had been too dark for her to see their faces, she said, but she felt sure that's who it was. Based on this, the grand jury was unable to return an indictment, and the case went into limbo. Four years passed before the case began making headlines again. Philip Payne, the managing editor of the New York Daily Mirror, received information that allowed him to push the case into the active files again. One of the newspaper's reporters was covering a routine divorce case and realized that the defendant had once been employed as a maid for Reverend Hall at the time of the murders. The maid's husband was suing for divorce on the grounds that she had committed adultery, and one of the men she was accused of sleeping with was Reverend Hall. It was further alleged that Mrs. Hall gave the maid $6,000 to keep quiet about the affair and to confirm an alibi that she was home at the time of the murders. The reporter informed Payne of the allegations and he put pressure on the New Jersey governor and the state's attorney general to reopen the investigation. The police moved quickly and made simultaneous arrests of Mrs. Hall and her two brothers. Henry Carpenter was not implicated in the crime. The Klan was indicted, and they went on trial for murder. Crowds filled the courtroom during the trial, and the newspapers loved the strangeness of the affair. The Stephen family, thanks to their numerous eccentricities, made great copy. The key witness in the case was the pig woman, who was now dying of cancer. Unable to walk, she was forced to testify from her hospital bed, which was wheeled into the courtroom each day. The pig woman's aged mother also came to the courtroom and sat near her daughter's bed. Whenever her daughter would speak, she kept remarking loudly, she's a liar, a liar, a liar, that's what she is and what she's always been. Another addition to the unusual cast of characters was Charlotte Mills, the daughter of murder victim Eleanor Mills. She had become a reporter after her mother's death and, thanks to her familiarity with the case, was assigned to cover the trial by her editor. Her reporting was far from unbiased, and almost every article had a reference to Mrs. Hall's dowdy wardrobe and frumpy appearance. There were a number of witnesses called by the state, but they chose to hinge the prosecution on the testimony of Jane Gibson, the pig woman. She managed to moan her testimony from her deathbed, with Mrs. Hall and her brothers glaring at her and her own mother loudly protesting each statement with her ramblings about what a liar her daughter was. It would have been humorous if not for the tragic nature of the case and the people involved. Mrs. Gibson testified that she had been riding her mule on the night of the murders, chasing corn thieves from her property. A short distance away, she saw the defendants get out of a car and walk quietly into the apple orchard. Gibson dismounted and began following them to see where they were going. She then said that she saw five figures near the tree and heard a voice exclaim, "'Explain these letters!' She said that she heard shouts, cursing and the sounds of fighting, and then, she said, she saw two men, Reverend Hall and Henry Stevens, on the ground. A shot was fired, and then a woman began screaming, My God! My God! Three more shots were fired, and the woman was silent. Gibson decided to get back to her mule, but as she started to leave, she looked back and saw Mrs. Hall bending over what appeared to be a body. She saw something silver flash in the woman's hand, and then Mrs. Hall made slashing motions toward the figure on the ground. The pig woman then fled to her mule and left the scene. While her story was compelling, Gibson's memory proved to be faulty under cross-examination. The defense was unable to break her account of what happened that night, but they were able to show that she did not remember her three husbands' names or even when she divorced any of them. Her memory of anything outside of the murders was hazy at best, the dying woman's efforts to recall the normal aspects of her life created enough reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury that they simply could not bring back a guilty verdict. Mrs. Hall and her brothers were released. Jane Gibson, the pig woman, lived until 1930, and to the day she died, she insisted that her story of the events on that night was true. Mrs. Hall and her brothers sued the New York Daily Mirror and received an undisclosed settlement, after that, they faded away into history. And if the killer was anyone outside of the Stevens family, he disappeared too. The murders of the preacher and the choir director have never been solved. We 
We all know someone who struggles with depression, whether we know it or not. It's something that those who suffer tend to deal with in silence, in the shadows. But the organizations we are supporting with our annual Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser this month are working to make it easier for those in the darkness to come into the light, to find help, and to learn that they're not alone, that there are ways to overcome the darkness and live normal lives. I'm evidence of that myself. I, too, suffer from depression. Our goal is to raise at least 5000 this month, but the more we raise, the more people we can help to climb out of their own personal darkness. If you've not donated yet, or if you want to give again, or maybe you'd like to grab the link and share the fundraiser on your own social media and challenge others to give, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. The fundraiser ends on Halloween, so please give right now while you're thinking about it. WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. Sudden death over time. Sudden death over time. I'm Weird Darkness. Most of us have, on one or several occasions, had a déjà vu experience. It's the strange feeling we have experienced or witnessed something before. The term déjà vu is French and means literally already seen. For a long time, this eerie sensation has been attributed to everything from paranormal disturbances to neurological disorders. In recent years, as more scientists began studying the phenomenon, a number of theories about déjà vu have emerged, suggesting that it's not merely a glitch in our brain's memory system. Psychologists have suggested that déjà vu may occur when specific aspects of a current situation resemble certain aspects of previously occurring situations. If there's a lot of overlap between the elements of the new and old situations, we get a strong feeling of familiarity. Alternative explanations associate déjà vu with prophecy past life memories, clairvoyance, or a mystic signpost indicating fulfillment of a predetermined condition on the journey of life. Whatever the explanation, déjà vu is certainly a phenomenon that is universal to the human condition, and its fundamental cause is still a mystery. Another intriguing possibility is that there is a hidden connection between déjà vu and the existence of parallel universes. As some of you may already know, the multiverse is a theory in which our universe is not the only universe, but states that many universes exist parallel to each other. These distinct universes within the multiverse theory are called parallel universes. According to Dr. K. Koo, quantum physics states that there's a possibility that déjà vu might be caused by your ability to flip between different universes. Dr. K. Koo mentions Professor Steve Weinberg, the famous theoretical physicist and Nobel Prize winner, supports the idea of a multiverse. Weinberg says there is an infinite number of parallel realities coexisting with us in the same room. There are hundreds of different radio waves being broadcast all around you from distant stations, he said. At any given instant, your office or car or living room is full of these radio waves. However, if you turn on a radio, you can listen to only one frequency at a time. These other frequencies are not in phase with each other. Each station has a different frequency, different energy. As a result, your radio can only be tuned to one broadcast at a time. Likewise, in our universe, we are tuned into the frequency that corresponds to physical reality. But there is an infinite number of parallel realities coexisting with us in the same room, although we cannot tune into them. While your radio is tuned to pick up a certain frequency, and thus a single radio station, our universe consists of atoms that are oscillating at a unique frequency that other universes are not vibrating at. Universes are usually not in phase, that is, vibrating at the same frequency with each other due to the divisions caused by time, but when they are in phase, it is theoretically possible to move back and forth between universes. So although it is uncertain, it could be possible that when you are experiencing déjà vu, you are vibrating in unison with a parallel universe. Déjà vu is not always a pleasant experience, of course. 
One of the most bizarre deja vu cases ever recorded deals with a man who was trapped in an eternal time loop. This man experienced never-ending deja vu, and his condition reached a stage when he avoided watching television, listening to the radio, and reading newspapers because he felt that he had encountered it all before. The case of the unnamed British young man who experienced never-ending deja vu for the last eight years of his life intrigued scientists. Never before had anyone heard of a similar case. What could cause a person to be trapped in an eternal time loop? Doctors from the UK, France, and Canada examined the man who was 23 years old at the time. He first experienced the sensation in 2007, shortly after he started university. It soon became clear that the man did not exhibit any of the neurological conditions usually associated with those who suffer from déjà vu. Dr. Chris Moylan, a cognitive neuropsychologist who worked on the study, says the man had a history of depression and anxiety and had once taken the drug LSD while at university, but was otherwise completely healthy. This man was striking because he was young, otherwise aware, but completely traumatized by his constant sensation that his mind was playing tricks, the doctor said. For minutes, and sometimes even longer, the patient would feel that he was reliving experiences. He likened the frightening episodes to being in the psychological thriller film Donnie Darko. There was one instance where he went in to get a haircut. As he walked in, he got a feeling of déjà vu. And then he had déjà vu of the déjà vu. He couldn't think of anything else, says Dr. Moylan. Brain scans appeared normal, suggesting the cause was psychological rather than neurological. Whilst this case on its own does not prove a link between anxiety and déjà vu, it raises an interesting question for further study. Scientists now propose that they have made progress in their attempts to shed light on the sometimes uncanny experience. Can there be a connection between the déjà vu experience and the I know this was going to happen feeling? If so, how are these two related? Anne Cleary, a memory researcher at Colorado State University who is one of the world's experts on déjà vu, says she has a new theory on why déjà vu is accompanied not only by feelings of prediction, but also an I knew that was going to happen feeling a minute later. Cleary places humans in laboratories to induce déjà vu, and the results of her studies are interesting. Prior experiments had uncovered a strong predictive bias in people having déjà vu. Studies show people feel like they know what's going to happen next. The situation is different in a lab where people who were having déjà vu were not able to actually predict what was going to happen next. That predictive feeling, however intense, was just that, a feeling. If this is an illusion, just a feeling, why do people so strongly believe they actually predicted what unfolded next, Cleary said in a press statement. I wondered if there was an explanation in some sort of cognitive illusion. To test that theory in the lab, Cleary and co-authors immersed a bank of test subjects in a video game-like scene created in The Sims' virtual world. Subjects were asked if they were experiencing déjà vu. Next, the virtual scene would turn left or right. Then participants were asked, did the scene unfold the way you expected? In a later experiment, participants were further asked to rate the familiarity of the scene, both before and after the turn. After crunching their results, the researchers found that when intense feelings of prediction accompanied déjà vu, they were strongly correlated with feelings of postdiction that the person reported after the fact that they knew what particular turn was going to happen. But the experiment was set up so it would be impossible for them to know, because the turns were made at random. The I knew that it was going to happen bias was very strong when déjà vu occurred, and especially strong when the scene happened to be rated as very familiar. But, like the feelings of prediction, the feelings of having gotten the prediction right were not rooted in reality. In other words, déjà vu gave the subjects not only predictive feelings, but a strong hindsight bias after the fact. Cleary's team concluded that the high degree of familiarity that accompanies déjà vu also carries through to the postdictive bias. If the entire scene feels intensely familiar as it unfolds, that might trick our brains into thinking we got it right after all, Cleary said. Because it felt so familiar as you were going through it, it felt like you knew all along how it was going to go, even if that could not have been the case. 
So the I knew that was going to happen bias is probably all part of the illusion of prediction that often accompanies deja vu. According to Cleary's prior experiments, deja vu is a memory phenomenon in which we're trying to retrieve a memory but we can't place it, sort of like the feeling of a word on the tip of your tongue. She has previously demonstrated in the lab that when scenes in The Sims mapped spatially to different scenes that were viewed earlier but forgotten, more instances of deja vu occur. Cleary was driven to do experiments probing the postdictive bias because it felt like a missing puzzle piece to her existing theories on why deja vu tends to be associated with clairvoyance. Since she started studying deja vu over a decade ago, she has had countless people describe to her their deja vu experiences, including when they were very sure they had predicted something without explanation. And it's not just people who believe in the supernatural. Many of them are what she calls trained skeptics, even fellow memory researchers who report extremely unsettling deja vu experiences in which they feel like they predicted what was going to happen next. The only thing more spooky than Halloween in October is Spooky Empire. Join me October 27th through the 29th in Orlando, Florida to meet horror celebrities like A Nightmare on Elm Street's Freddy Krueger, Robert England, and co-star Heather Langenkamp. Hellraiser's Doug Pinhead Bradley will be there with other casts from the film, Candyman's Tony Todd, An American Werewolf in London's David Naughton, The Crypt Keeper John Kassir, Rose McGowan from Charmed and Death Proof, Kane Hodder from the Friday the 13th films, Harry Hamlin from Clash of the Titans, and and so many more, including Cassandra Peterson, better known as Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Get autographs, take photos, and hear Q&A sessions with your favorite horror celebs. They've even asked me to moderate a few celebrity Q&As, too. You'll also find horror-themed workshops like making movie props and makeup, horror writing, and more. Get all the details, see a full list of the celebrities, and grab your tickets at SpookyEmpire.com. That's SpookyEmpire.com, and I hope to see you there October 27th through the 29th in Orlando, Florida. Hey weirdos, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at weirddarkness.com listen.